and more people are coming. So hi everybody, my name is Ben Loomer and I'm the uh, Community Service Learning Coordinator at LEARN, which is a nonprofit that works with the English speaking community of Quebec. And I'm really happy to be hosting this wonderful webinar called Bringing Place-Based Learning and Mindfulness into Nature. So as I mentioned before, I invite you to introduce yourself using the chat box. Um, please let us know what school board you're from uh, and what brought you here. And I would also like to welcome our three guests who I had the pleasure of meeting over the last two or three weeks as we prepare for this webinar. So specifically Sharon, Dana, and Shannon. And just a bit of a story of how we got here is that about a month and a half ago, uh, I was part of a webinar with Shannon around um, outdoor education and her work at EMSB base. And once it was done, it was great, it was successful. She thought it was really important that I meet Sharon and Dana who were doing some great work uh, with their school. And the conversation started and after we spoke, I said, you know what, this is something that we need more people around the province to hear about. Um, and so this is how things got started. And with that, I wanna invite uh, Sharon to introduce herself and then Dana and Shannon, and then we'll get started. So Sharon, welcome and uh, perhaps give a quick introduction. Perfect, thank you, Ben. I'm really excited to be here. Um, so my name is Sharon. Um, I studied in the area of psychology at Concordia University. I specialized in childhood attachment uh, throughout my studies. Uh, I presently work at uh, Leonardo da Vinci Academy as a behavior technician, part of the English Montreal School Board. Throughout the uh, past four years, I've been working in various schools, working with students with various needs, cognitive disabilities, physical disabilities. And I love the area of play and play-based learning. And I try my best and no matter what I do, to bring play into children's lives. So throughout the past year, I actually got um, the privilege of being by the Jays Care Foundation, which is an, uh, it's an organization that works with the Toronto Blue Jays, where we work with children that have various um, disabilities and abilities with baseball. So I presently coach an adapted baseball team in Montreal, and I also brought uh, an adapted baseball team to Leonardo da Vinci Academy for the first time. So that was very exciting. Uh, and last year, Dana and I uh, met and we started a pilot project at Leonardo da Vinci Academy with play-based learning, and it was a tremendous success. So I love bringing play into what I'm doing and I thought that this would be a great platform to just share the work that we've all been working really hard towards. So yeah, that's a bit about me. Great, thank you. Uh, Dana, do you want to do a quick introduction, please? Sure, thank you so much. I'm also so, so happy to be here. I'm a teacher of well-being. I am passionate about health, mindfulness, self-awareness, empowerment, and basically balance of the mind, body, and spirit. I have a range of experience teaching from resource tutoring to mindful practices such as yoga and meditation. And as Sharon mentioned, last year, I had the opportunity to co-create this pilot project on play-based learning where we took children into nature to freely explore. And my intention is to help people discover the power of prioritizing well-being and to support it in becoming a key part of education. Thank you, and Shannon. Hi, I'm Shannon. I am a green program facilitator with the EMSB. Uh, so I take kids outside in various ways. We work in gardens, we look for bugs, we do all kinds of stuff like that. I'm also a trained yoga teacher and my life, it, yoga and meditation and mindfulness are so important. And I see all of the benefits this has brought me and I often incorporate those things on an experimental basis with my students. And I've seen great results bringing these things together, outdoor learning, uh, self-directed learning, and present moment awareness. I think these are great things for all kids to have. Great, thank you very much. So just a quick overview of what we're gonna be talking about for the next uh, 50 minutes or so, is we um, are gonna have a presentation from Dana, Sharon, and Shannon. And then once they're done, we will open it up for discussion and questions around play-based learning in your own experience, mindfulness as well in your schools. And hopefully we can learn from each other and grow this concept in all of our schools. So with that, I'll pass the mic over to Sharon. Go ahead, please. Perfect, thank you. So before I begin, I just wanna give a quick overview of how these two ideas came together. So the title of the presentation is 
bringing play-based learning and mindfulness into nature. So today um, we're going to be talking about how the pilot project at LDVA uh, and the field trip we had, how we saw the excitement that came out of bringing children into nature. Dana and I really saw the benefits of this and I've known Shannon for the past four years and her and I talked about how wouldn't it be amazing if we brought kids into nature, but made them be mindful and aware of, you know, their, their senses and just be still in nature. So we had this like idea of play-based learning. We had this idea of mindfulness. Wouldn't it be great if schools actually bring these two things together in the future? So that's where we're kind of going towards in this presentation. So I just want to give a little overview of bringing those two ideas together. So we're going to begin. So play. So what is play? We all know that children have this instinctual drive to play. When you bring children into a field, you bring them into a classroom and you allow them to play, the one emotion that they all feel is joy. We know that play is something that children learn from and it has a lot of many beneficial effects. When it comes to the mind, when children are playing, they're creative, they're thinking abstractly, they're having so many amazing ideas flowing. When it comes to the body, uh, play allows for movement. When you bring children into, into nature, they're able to climb, to move, to run. It allows them to just fully express whatever they're feeling using their bodies. When it comes to their emotions, uh, bring, play really brings children the ability to feel happiness, to feel joy, and it also makes them learn how to self-regulate their emotions. If they're having difficulty with something, they discover how they're feeling through play. And it's a, not only is it a way for them to self-regulate, but if they're having a hard time self-regulating their emotions, it's a great opportunity for it's a great opportunity for teachers and educators to step in and say, okay, what does this child need? How can I help them self-regulate? Lastly, whenever children play, they're mostly being social with other kids. So this is a great chance for them to learn how to share, how to take turns, and how to collaborate with one another. Now, we know that play overall has many, many beneficial effects. And when I met Dana last year, we really connected on the whole topic of play. And we said, would it be amazing if we brought play into classrooms and we would let play be the vehicle for learning? And that's exactly what we did. Thank you to the openness of the principal and the vice principal at Leonardo da Vinci Academy. We had the privilege to do a pilot project of play-based learning at LDVA with the kindergarten teachers, and it was a complete success. We saw so much learning, so much growth, and most importantly, the children had fun. So um, what Dana and I did at this school was we were, basically, we were basically training teachers on the whole idea of how do we implement play-based learning into classrooms. So we set up the classrooms with five different areas of learning. We had literacy, numeracy, dramatic play, engineering, and science. We let the children freely gravitate to what interested them. So in order for us to understand what is play-based learning, we can, view, we can view it on the following continuum, where on one end, you have free play. On the complete other end, you have teacher-directed play. And in the middle, you have play-based learning. So what is free play? Well, free play is initiated by the student and it's directed by the student. So here children are completely free to play with whatever they want in the classroom and they are, there's no learning outcome involved in free play. When you look on the complete other end of the spectrum, you have teacher directed play. And this is where there is a learning outcome. It's initiated by the teacher and it's directed by the teacher. So for example, a kindergarten teacher could say, okay, everyone in the classroom, we're gonna play a fun game. Uh, search for something that is round and purple and then they have to go look for that or look for something that is um, you know, a square and green. So you're making it fun, but there's a learning outcome involved. Now, what Dana and I were focusing on last year was really bringing play-based learning and this framework of learning to the, to the classroom. So in play-based learning, it's initiated by the student it's directed by the student with the teacher's support, and it involves scaffolding. So in play-based learning, it provides opportunities for children to direct their own play while allowing opportunities for the teacher to integrate academic and developmental skills into the play. So the teacher's role would be uh, a lot of scaffolding. So scaffolding is whenever the teacher is adding support in order to enhance learning by bridging the gap between what the student uh, what the student's current and potential level of compl complex thinking is. So I'm going to break it down in the following way. So when we're looking at play-based learning, we explain to teachers that it's mostly about the process. It's not about the product. So children simply have fun and learn while they're playing. It's not about creating something specific at the end of it. Um, it's also about supporting students in finding their own solutions. So when we brought our students to Beaver Lake and our field trip, some students were asking me, Ms. Sharon, how many ladybugs are, are there on this rock? 
And I said, well, let's figure it out together. Let's count it together. So you're a collaborator in learning when it comes to play-based learning. As a teacher, you're basically collaborating with them to actually find the answer. You're also asking open-ended questions and you're also asking them what happens when questions to guide their thinking. So I'm going to give an example. Um, at Beaver Lake, we had a student who really, really wanted to create a home for her insects. And she kept building this home with these very skinny sticks. And the, the home she was building kept falling. So I asked her, well, what happens when you're using these skinny sticks? She told me, it keeps falling. So I said, well, is there anything else in this environment that you could use to make a stronger home for the insects? So she ended up going and creatively picking out different objects like thicker sticks and leaves and rocks and she ended up figuring out her own solution to this problem I kind of helped guide her through questioning but I didn't give her the answer uh, also you're making objective observations so I see you're digging a hole inside the earth play-based learning offers an opportunity for you to actually use the words within their play that they can actually learn new words by actually doing the thing uh, and you're making learning visible by commenting so i love how you didn't give up in trying to solve this so you're you're really reinforcing them trying very very hard now that and i thought well wouldn't it be a great idea if you know, we know that nature has great effects on children. It has a big open space. We know that kids love play-based learning. Why don't we see if we can get them to have a field trip where we bring them to a nature uh, location and we bring this play-based learning approach? And thankfully, they said yes. The principal and the vice principal allowed us to bring them to Beaver Lake. So last May, with the help of uh, the phys ed teacher, Mr. Godet, who is here today, uh, we actually have some teachers from kindergarten here today as well. Uh, they all came with us and we had a childcare worker and we made this amazing field trip happen, which I'm gonna be speaking about. So uh, we brought them to Beaver Lake, we had 60, uh, total students and we, we divided them into groups of three so there was three groups of 20 students now Dana and I were responsible for the area of play-based learning uh, we made sure before we actually brought them to Beaver Lake that we explained to them you know safety so if you see something uh, like a piece of glass you don't pick it up we taught them that you know you have to respect nature you know you have to be nice to the creatures you don't tear out plants from the floor like we explained to them how to be in nature to respect it uh, and we were there if they had any questions, but we basically divided the area into, into three. We had the play-based learning, which Dana and I were, were, were taking care of. We had Mr. Godet's uh, scavenger hunt area where he uh, put a bunch of like cool toys uh, hidden in different parts and they had to go find and he gave them some clues and they had a, a really, really fun time there. And then the other part was uh, a structure play area. They have a beaver lake where there's like some monkey bars, there's some, uh, there's some slides. And that was what they were doing there. So the reason we split it up was because we couldn't have all 60 kids in the play-based learning area. What we did is we allowed students to alternate. So one hour they came to play-based learning, then they went with Mr. Godet, then they went to the structure play. So um, it was basically um, alter alternations across. And the things that we witnessed that day were truly magical. And that's what I'm going to be explaining in the next slide. So play in nature and what does that bring out? We had one student in the first picture, you see, this is all about courage. She was, uh, she was walking around and she noticed this like very long log and she looked at me and she said, Ms. Sharon, I really want to walk across this log, but I'm very scared. And I said, okay. I'm like, what scares you about it? She's like, I don't know. What if I fall and like I get hurt? I said, look, I said, fear is completely normal. We're all scared to do things. But sometimes in life, in order to get over your fear, you actually have to face it. So I said, do you want to try to face your fear today? And I'm completely here to support you. And she looked at me with a lot of hesitation and she said, I'm going to try. So I said, okay, let's try. So she took one step. And then she took another and as you can see here she's very focused and she made it across and she was so proud of herself she walked across the log and i told her well how did it feel and she said i'm so happy i did it i said yeah i'm like it's like this in anything else in life like you can apply this like if you're scared of something you know you can always always face that fear and learn you know what your limits are and overcome them so here she set a goal and she reached it uh, also it's important to just discuss risky play a lot of times we're scared to make uh, children explore you know nature because we're scared what if they get hurt what if they fall but part of you know learning is assessing and managing risk children need to learn when something is dangerous where they can get hurt or when something is not dangerous where they just think it is so learning how to assess risk is incredibly important and in this field trip they really learned how to assess risk 
In the next picture, you see curiosity. And we saw so much curiosity that day. Here you see a picture of a tree that fell to the floor. And I had about seven or eight kids surrounding me. And they all asked me the same question. Miss Sharon, how did this tree fall? So I said, okay, this is a great opportunity for some scaffolding, asking them some open-ended questions. So I said, well, what do you think could have caused a tree to fall? One kid told me, oh, I think the wind blew it over. And then I got one kid tell me, oh, I think a person actually pushed it down. And then the interesting one was, miss, I think there was a fire and that's how the tree fell. I said, oh, okay, a fire. I said, well, if a fire happened in this forest, do you think only this one tree would have been affected? Or what other trees around here would have been affected? And they looked around and they said, oh no, all the other trees are perfectly fine. So I said, do you think then the fire caused this? And they're like, no, no, it, it can't be a fire. So you could see how they had all these questions and they wanted to know how things were working. And this was all self-led. They wanted to know more. Children have an innate uh, desire to ask questions and nature and play brought that out. And that was so magical to see that day. Next, we have creativity. So this student is the girl I mentioned earlier. She was creating an insect home. She had these little sticks and she was making uh, you know, a home for them and she was using rocks, she was using leaves and she was so proud to show me her, her, creative, uh, her creative home that she made with all the different parts of nature that she, uh, that she made into this uh, insect home. Uh, in the bottom here left picture, you see a multi-sensory experience where children came to me and said, Miss Sharon, we want to know if uh, insects or animals are living inside this tree. We're gonna go. We're gonna go find out. So I followed them to this tree, and you, as you can see, there is like a big hole in the tree, and they were listening to see if they heard anything. And then they peeked their head inside, and they were trying to see if they actually saw anything crawling. Then they were touching it. So you can see how in nature we're using all our senses without even knowing it. And this actually gave children that opportunity. Next, we see the development of literacy. Uh, this student took a piece of branch and was writing in the earth. Uh, I asked her, well, what are you doing there? And she said, oh, Mr. Ryan, I'm just writing my name. And she was writing words out. And for educators and teachers, this is a great opportunity for scaffolding where, you know, if a student is trying to spell out a word, you can potentially help them with like, phonetically sounding it out. So let's say she wanted to spell the word mud and she was having a hard time. You can tell her, okay, well, let's sound it out like mud and you can, you know, write it in with her into the earth. So, you know, nature has these tools that we can use even for literacy. Um, the next photo is about numeracy. So here students were happily counting treasures. They collected a whole array of rocks and they labeled it treasure and they were counting it with their sticks and comparing, oh, how many did you count? And the other student said, oh, I counted this much. How much did you count? So the teachers were so happy to see students counting, uh, creating arrays of, of rocks and just using numbers naturally without actually being told to do so. So you can see here how play overall happens naturally and nature was just a beautiful source for all of this creativity, courage to just come out. One other thing nature really, really uh, does is it brings out a sense of calm, focus, and flow in students. We had this one student who came to us, uh, Dana and I, and he had his hand out and he had a snail on it. And he's like, look, I found a snail and he was staring at this snail for about seven or eight minutes. He was so focused and memorized by the snail. He was looking at the complexities and the way, the way it was slowly moving. And, you know, the teacher came up to me and she said, Sharon, you know, this is a student who typically in class cannot sit still for more than two or three minutes. His attention is usually everywhere. And I'm so, so surprised to see him so focused right now. And I said, well, sometimes it's about giving them the environment and letting them guide what interests them. So he was totally fascinated by this. So he was focused and he was able to be calm and in a state of complete bliss. So nature brought that out in him as well. So now we're going to talk about how we can prioritize well-being through nature with Dana. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, everyone can hear me? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so as uh, Sharon has mentioned, Johnny, who's usually distracted in class, he was very calm while he was exploring nature. And he mainly played by himself. And he was so immersed, fully present. And when he did come to me with this piece of bark and a snail crawling along it, he's like, Miss Dana, look. And I was seeing this snail crawling along this piece of bark. And then I'm looking at him, looking at the snail. and he the awe in his face, like he was so grounded and you could feel that he was feeling very secure in his environment. 
And the fact that he wanted to connect and share his experience with me, it's something I hadn't seen in him before. Um, and it was genuine. So that's the part that really was really mind blowing for me to see, because that's not the same student. It was just like, who is this boy? And um, this shows us how nature supports mindfulness. And this mindful state, it's necessary for our mental health. Dr. Delphine Vizina and Dr. Stuart Shanker, they speak of the many stresses that children experience and that trauma, it's a lot more common than one would think. And the symptoms of a child um, dealing with stress is a lot, it's very similar actually to a child that has behavioral issues and even ADHD at times. Um, and as adults, we know ourselves that when we have something on our mind, it's so hard for us to concentrate. And then you think about how much concentration is required of students in the system that we're usually in. So, and then there's the issue of screens that we have everywhere, which shows you how much children are playing less and they're not using their creativity as much and they're not in nature as much either. So mental health needs to be a priority in education and being in nature supports that. And you know, humans are deeply connected to nature. So not only does it provide fresh air, food, clean water, but medicinal plants, and the earth itself, it's a conductor of free electrons so that when your skin and your feet, I'm sure gardeners know this and Shannon knows this, um, touch the soil, um, these electrons get absorbed into your body. And these electrons are some of nature's most strongest antioxidants. The healing microbes in the soil um, have similar effects to antidepressants. And studies show that trees and plants emit compounds, they're known as phytocytes which have very similar effects to aromatherapy. So that when you're inhaling that, your blood composition, it changes to protect you from cancer. That increases your immunity and it lowers your blood pressure, it lowers anxiety, and nature harmonizes the body's natural rhythms, which reduces stress, inflammation, cortisol, and pain. There are people who talk about how the more time they spend in nature, the less pain they experience and they have, let's say, arthritis or any other kind of issue. Um, so, you know, even just being in nature and ob observing it yourself, you can just feel that presence is undeniable. And imagine taking it a step further where you're bringing mindfulness into nature. So with that, let's take a few moments and uh, experience a mindfulness practice with uh, Shannon. Okay, we can all hear me. So basically, mindfulness is just present moment awareness. And these are fantastic tools for anybody. If children learn how to do this, they can take that through their life. And this is their best defense against anxiety, depression, social disorders. We all know we spend so much time, like Dana said, worrying about other things in the future, in the past. And the best way to calm ourselves is to just be in that moment. So we are gonna go through a little mindful moment here. So what I would like to invite you to do right now is just close your eyes and breathe. I want you to just inhale and exhale. Just breathe naturally. Let your breath go however it goes. Breathe in and breathe out. Now, we're gonna take an inhale in, and I want you to feel that breath coming in through your nose. Feel how it feels going through your nostrils. Feel how it feels going down your throat. As you inhale, it filling up your lungs. And as you exhale, feel the difference, how it feels going back out through your throat, through your nose, and through your nostrils. Breathe in, breathe out, and just feel it. Now we're gonna focus that breath a bit. So when you breathe in this time, I want you to focus on the bottom of your belly. Breathe in and fill up the bottom of your belly and feel that expand, feel the breath go in, feel it fill up and exhale. Let it all come out nice and slowly and feel it go back out your body. Inhale again and this time we're gonna focus on our chest. You're gonna just fill up your chest let it go out wide, feel all the directions your chest moves with that breath coming in. And exhale and feel how your chest goes back down and in. Inhale, now we're gonna focus on our neck and our shoulders. 
Fill up that whole top part of your body with breath. Feel it go in and exhale. Feel it come back out. Now inhale again, we're gonna fill all of those. So fill up your belly, feel it expand out. Fill up your chest, feel your ribs expand. Fill up your shoulders, your chest, your neck. And let it all go back out. Empty out your chest, empty out your ribs, empty out your belly. Now just inhale and exhale naturally. Now this time we're gonna shift the focus again. I want you to breathe into your feet. Feel your feet and imagine them filling up with breath. As you inhale, it goes into your feet and as you exhale, it comes back out of your feet. Now feel everything around your feet. Feel where it's touching the floor, where it's touching your shoes or your clothing. Feel everything your feet are feeling the air on them, whatever your feet are touching, just feel that and focus on that feeling in your feet. Inhaling, exhaling and feeling your feet. Now we're gonna shift our focus again and I want you to breathe into your hands. Breathe into your hands, feel them fill up with breath and now feel everything around them. Feel the air on your skin, Feel where your fingertips are. Feel your palms. Feel where they're touching the chair or touching their other or touching your body. Just feel all the things your hands are feeling. Inhale. Exhale. Now I want you to breathe in through your nose. And as you breathe in, I want you to focus on your sense of smell. I want you to smell everything that's coming in your nose around you. Maybe it's food, perfume, whatever that smell is coming in, just smell it. You can focus on the most prominent smell and smell just that. Just the smell of what's in the air around you. Inhale again, exhale, and we're gonna shift our focus to our eyes. Now your eyes are closed, but they can still see. I want you to breathe in and look through your eyes. Look at whatever your eyes are seeing. Maybe it's just darkness. Maybe there's lights or colors behind your eyes. Maybe there's sparkles, stars. Whatever it is, just look and see. Focus on one of those things and see how it shifts and change and just watch it. Whatever you're seeing, you just see it. Now inhale and we're gonna shift our focus again. And I want you to focus on your tongue in your mouth. Just your tongue. And as you focus on your tongue, notice if there's a taste whatever you're tasting. Could be what you just ate, could just be your mouth, could be anything. But just focus on whatever taste you're tasting. Maybe it's sweet, maybe it's sour, salty. Just taste it. Whatever that taste is in your mouth. Inhale. And we're gonna shift our focus to our ears. Move to your ears and listen. Listen to all the sounds your ears can hear. You can hear my voice. Maybe you can hear children outside or in your house, birds. Whatever it is, just listen to what you're hearing. Now I want you to pick a sound besides my voice, whatever it is. You can still hear my voice, but I want you to hear that sound. Whatever you're hearing, focus and just listen to it. Listen to whatever you're hearing.
Now shift that hearing focus again. And I want you to hear your own breath. Listen to how your breath sounds when it's coming in your nose. Where is the sound coming from? Just hear that sound as your breath goes in and your breath goes out. Now take that breath, hear it, see if you can feel it while you're listening. Feel it go back in through your nose. Feel it go down your throat, into your chest, into your belly. Feel that breath coming in and feel that breath going out. Now you're gonna come back in. Feel your whole body, whatever you can feel. Feel what it feels like to sit wherever you're sitting. Feel the chair under you or behind you. Feel the open space, feel everything that's not touching anything. What does that feel like? Feel your clothes on your skin. Feel your heartbeat. Take a deep inhale, fill up your whole belly, fill up your whole chest and ribs. Fill up your neck and shoulders and let it all come out. Now, I'm going to invite you again to take another breath in and open your eyes and see where you are. And I just want you to look around the room wherever you are, see what's there. And I want you to pay attention to your own body for a minute. See if you feel any difference from when we started. Is your heart beating a little softer? Does the sound sound a little brighter? Does the light look a little brighter? Does everything look the same? Whatever it is, it doesn't matter. Just notice what your body feels like right now. So this is one technique. There's a million techniques that we can use to bring ourselves into present moment awareness. The breath is always a great one. And the senses are always great ones because wherever we are, it doesn't matter where you are or what you're doing, you're always breathing, you're always smelling, you're always seeing, you're always tasting, you're always touching. So at any time, we can use these to bring ourselves into present moment awareness. And we can use these things to bring kids into present moment awareness. And if you feel a difference in your calm, you're not alone. Everyone has an effect beneficial of bringing themselves into that present moment, children included, 100%. So Sharon is gonna give you some other ways that we've developed for our play-based in nature pedagogical days on how you can bring mindfulness into the play and into nature so that kids can experience how to be right there in that moment. Kids are naturally generally in the present moment, but we can always use these tools to bring them in a little more. Perfect. Thank you so much, Shannon. So on that note, we're going to be talking just about that. So how can we bring this sense of calm and like being aware of your senses to children. So I'm sure all of you feel very, very calm right now. And like Shannon just said, we can definitely bring more of this into outdoor nature experiences or field trips that we do with the kids. So what I'm going to be doing now is giving you some techniques. Um, some of them are referenced from the book that you see in the bottom right corner of this slide. It's called Into Nature. I highly recommend educators, teachers, anyone working in daycares that works with children. Um, this book gives a lot of great techniques that you can incorporate in nature to bring sensory awareness among the five senses into children's lives. So today I'm going to be going over just a few. These are not all of them. There's a 
lot more. I'm just giving you a little taste into what it could look like if you were to bring kids actually into nature. So um, we're going to start with mindful laying. So one of the activities that they highlight in this book is called Breathing Canopy. And I'm actually going to, I'm going to read it out so that you can get a general idea of what you would be doing. So the first thing you would do is let's say you bring them to a beautiful nature park. If we would have brought them to, let's say, Beaver Lake, you let them lie down, uh, you let them look up and you lead them through the following experience called breathing canopy. Lie down beneath a tree, look up into the canopy of the tree. As you breathe in, watch one leaf. As you breathe out, move to another leaf. One breath, one leaf. Let your attention flow from one leaf to the next. Your mind may wander off to other things. Notice where it goes, to a daydream, a worry, a plan, a memory, gently come back to breathing with the leaves. So this is a great, great activity to really incorporate the breath and their awareness of what they're seeing and following the gaze from one leaf to the next. They're really paying a lot of attention to the sense of vision and they're coming in tune with their breath. So this is a great calming exercise. Uh, the next one is called uh, passing clouds and you would have them basically do the following. So look up at the sky and notice the clouds. Are they moving fast or floating by slowly? Pick a cloud that speaks to you and keep your gaze fixed on it. Breathe as you stay connected with that cloud and follow it across the sky. Does it change form? Does it speed up? Does it slow down? So here you're really making children like focus on that one thing up above and just enjoy the experience of perceiving this one cloud and noticing everything about it. And just that could be so powerful, so calming. Next, you can allow them to just freely explore. As they're lying down, you can simply ask them, you know, no, no, there's no guide here. You're asking them, what do you hear? What do you feel? What do you smell? Let their imagination take control and let them freely explore. So that's part of lying down. Uh, if you want them to get moving, however, you can do some mindful walking exercises. So one of them uh, is, let's say it's fall, okay? And you know, whenever you walk in fall, your, your feet make a lot of like crunchy sounds. So let's say you would make them play around with that. So you ask them, okay, everyone, let's walk really, really fast and focus on what you hear whenever you're walking fast. And then you're going to change the pace. You're going to say, okay, now walk really, really slowly. What do you hear here? So you're letting them really play with their pace and letting them become aware of how their feet are making sounds on the floor. So right there, you're building that awareness. Um, the next activity is actually from the book. It's called Leaf Meditation. And what I really love about this activity is you're really incorporating the different senses into one with a leaf. So you're incorporating uh, seeing, feeling, and sensing. So you're going to ask students to pick one leaf, whichever one they want, and you would guide them through the following activity. So it's called leaf meditation. Close your eyes, hold the leaf to your heart, and feel as your body breathes. Slowly open your eyes and examine the leaf with a soft gaze. Explore, explore its surface, its veins, its stem, and its edges just seeing. Carefully take it between your fingers and touch its seams and sense its texture on your fingertips, just feeling. With some gentle pressure, rub your fingers back and forth. Find out if the leaf has a smell, just sensing. Close your eyes again and return to the sense of your body in this moment with this leaf. So here you can see how you're actually incorporating the different sensations of the body all through this leaf. Uh, lastly, another thing you can do with them as they're walking, let's say in a forest, is you let them freely explore. Again, there's no guide needed. You just let them explore their senses. So to summarize, you can see how nature really, really brings together um, play, play-based learning, and mindfulness. And one thing I think that's really important to keep in mind is, you know, if we really want children to protect and like understand the importance of nature, they have to feel connected to it. And bringing them into nature is a great way of doing this. Uh, we hope that, you know, in this presentation, it sparked interest in, you know, future outings where children are really bringing the benefits of play, all that nature has to offer, and the benefits that mindfulness in nature can offer children.
Um, so that is it for this presentation. I just want to say a quick uh, shout out to um, Sylvie. She's one of a teacher from Forest Hill. I know she spoke earlier, but she actually has an outdoor classroom in St. Lazar and her students are actually exposed to nature outdoors and she created her own outdoor classroom where they can go do music. She has a little classroom outside where she, she can teach. So, you know, schools are coming more, uh, becoming more aware of the importance of actually bringing learning outside. And there's something happening like not too far from us right now in that school. So I wanted to point that out. And um, I'm not sure, but I think Michelle is here today. She's a teacher from, um, she's not here, but there's a, a school in Toronto that I visited where they actually are doing play-based learning. Um, in the classrooms and uh, this is something that's happening a lot in Ontario and I hope that we can bring more play-based learning into classrooms here in Montreal. So everyone for listening and we're going to open the floor up to discussion now. So uh, Ben, it's back to you. Sure. Great. Thank you. Um, so uh, just take a look at this uh, slide really quick. Um, these are some of the references and some different emails. Um, but I'm going to stop sharing the screen so that uh, we can see each other a little bit. So I'm going to stop this. So um, basically I want to open it up to questions. I invite you to turn on your camera if, you're, if you feel comfortable doing so. Um, but I wanted to see if there's any questions, any stories around work that you're doing in your own schools or communities um, that, uh, that you, you want to share. Um, so, I'll stop talking for a second. Is there somebody who has a question or wants to share a particular uh, example of what they're doing in their own class? So I think I saw, Sylvie, did you want to share? I'll unmute you. Okay, here I am. Okay, I'm, I'm glad to be part of you. Excuse me, I'm francophone, but I can speak in English and I want, you know, I, I hope you can understand. I'm from uh, Forest Hill G Junior, uh, K21 at Saint-Lazare, and I'm teaching, uh, it's a Lester B school board uh, school, and I have a really nice forest just, just on area. It's part of uh, our playground, and I'm teaching there since, uh, I don't know, 23 years. It's my second home, and two years ago, I just, uh, um, Realize that we can aménage la forêt et uh, en faire une classe extérieure. It was a crazy idea. Uh, at this point, I didn't know that, you know, all about outdoor uh, classroom movement and da da da. You know, I just, I just um, go with my feeling. And I had all these kids who's coming and say, oh, Madame Sylvie, Madame Sylvie, uh, you know, they were playing balls and you know, complain all the time. So we, I start with this idea. Et euh, est-ce que ça vous ennuie si je le fais en français? Non, ça va. OK, alors, euh, donc, je suis partie avec cette idée-là euh, d'aménager la forêt. Euh, on a construit des... Tout d'abord, j'ai eu des belles collaborations avec un centre professionnel, commission scolaire francophone. Donc, il ne faut pas avoir peur d'aller cogner aux portes pour avoir des collaborations. Je crois beaucoup à ça. Euh, la municipalité aussi, je me suis transformée en, en gérante de chantier et euh, ça, ce projet-là, je l'ai traîné dans mon cœur, dans mon âme et euh, en, en fait, on a, j'ai une petite visite virtuelle là, sur euh, ma page Facebook, mais dans la forêt, on a aménagé justement une classe, euh, une classe extérieure, on a un mur musical, on a un, un, un hôtel à insectes, on a « mode kitchen ». Euh, on a un petit théâtre, on a un métier à tisser, on a Forest Hill TV. Et l'idée derrière ça, c'est de prendre nos, notre enseignement, nos apprentissages et de les, les amener à l'extérieur. Et j'étais, et je suis encore contre l'idée de prendre un cahier de mathématiques et d'aller s'asseoir à l'extérieur. C'est pas du tout ça. Quand on parle de mindfulness, ben nous, on le fait à tous les jours. Euh, quand on arrive dans la forêt, on prend le temps de s'arrêter. On a notre plateforme de yoga, les enfants se trouvent une place, regardent les arbres, on remercie la nature euh, de nous offrir ce moment-là. Ça, ça fait partie de notre routine. Euh, nous, au, à l'Estrubi, on travaille beaucoup avec les six C's. On essaie d'intégrer justement ces, euh, ces six C's-là dans, dans notre façon d'enseigner, dans notre façon de faire. 
Et euh, là, on est à créer, justement, même en mathématiques, à créer des... des je veux dire, mode kitchen, on enseigne les fractions euh, en mathématiques. Euh, donc, tout se prête euh, à l'enseignement. On a un arbre au fait où les enfants... C'est un arbre avec plein, plein de trous. Et les enfants, ben, ils peuvent écrire au fait. Alors, c'est un peu ça. Donc, moi, je vous invite... Euh, à aller faire un tour sur notre page Facebook et là où je suis rendue. C'est un peu ce qui m'intéressait avec Shannon, c'est en fait de partager euh, ma passion, mon expérience, parce que souvent, euh, il y a beaucoup d'écoles qui vont dire « Ah ouais, mais moi, euh, j'ai une, une cour en asphalte, mais tout est possible. » On a travaillé avec des matériaux, euh, des palettes de bois. Secteur francophone, il y a la fondation euh, Monique Fitzbach qui fait beaucoup. Euh, il y a Julie Moffette euh, qui travaille aussi. Euh, il y a le, le site web enseigné dehors. Il y a beaucoup, beaucoup de choses qui se font. Et euh, je pense qu'ensemble, ben, on peut arriver à faire quelque chose de, de vraiment, euh, vraiment incroyable. Puis ce que j'aimerais, moi, c'est pour ça que je suis venue, en fait, c'est euh, être capable de réseauter et d'être en mesure de créer des situations d'apprentissage euh, en mathématiques en français, en sciences, donc qui sont reliés au curriculum, donc au, à la progression des apprentissages. C'est un petit peu ça parce que euh, ce n'est pas tout d'aller dehors, mais il faut, faut être capable d'enseigner, mais enfin. Fait que je, pourrais, euh, je pourrais en parler plus, mais je vais laisser la parole à quelqu'un d'autre. Alors voilà, mais je vous invite à aller sur Facebook. Thank you, Sylvie. And in fact, maybe I'll ask you uh, if you want to put the address in, in the chat box and even some of the foundations for the grants and things. That would be wonderful, and I can share that afterwards. Il y, a, il y a vraiment beaucoup qui se fait, là, parce que, je veux dire, oui, on est du secteur anglophone, du secteur francophone, mais il ne faut pas avoir peur de faire le pont. Et je pense que, all together, tu sais, secteur francophone, le flexible seating, puis mindfulness, là, ils en ont besoin. Bien, nous, on a besoin de l'autre côté aussi. Mm -hmm. Alors, je pense que c'est vraiment important de collaborer. Thank you. Um, I, there was a question from, um, from Claudia. She was asking about uh, any activities for children with special needs. So Sharon or anyone else, do you have any experience working with uh, children with special needs uh, using the play-based learning pedagogy? Yeah, well, I can speak on that because I myself am a behavior technician. I've been a CCW as well in the schools and I work with children that have autism, ADD, ADHD, and One thing I've noticed with, you know, what Dana and I did in the classroom, what we did in nature, you know, the fact of play-based learning is that children guide where they go when it's play. So if children, let's say, uh, are very sensitive to something and we're letting them freely play, the chances are they're not going to gravitate to something that doesn't suit what they need. So the fact that we're putting them in an environment where they get to choose where they go, we haven't seen any children with, uh, with special needs really have issues per se. So that's something that I could say from my experience. And again, as a, as a behavior tech, you need to judge, right? If there's a child in a classroom and you see that you know, there's something off, you need to see, okay, well, what is causing that? And kind of looking at the underlying factors behind what may be causing a behavior. Uh, so just looking into that, but I don't know if she has a specific question on, you know, what would need to be implemented or, uh, but I can definitely answer to that. I can speak to that a little bit too, because in my groups, I have all kinds of kids. I have kids with behavioral issues, in different places on the autism spectrum. And I have kids come out with me and we will do entire garden renovations and landscaping projects. And some of these kids, I'll have the educators there and they'll say, that kid is the worst behaved kid. He's never going to do anything you say. It's not going to work. You can't take him out there. And those are the kids I always bring with me because I always watch them benefit the most. And the way I set up my programs and my classes is what I call project-based learning. This is why Sharon and I got on so well. So I'll have a project. I'll list out all the things that need to happen in order to make that project work. And the kids will choose what they want to do off of that list. And this is real work. They're landscaping, they're digging gardens, they're building boxes, they're laying paving stones. And this is elementary school. So these kids are kindergarten to grade six. Obviously I don't have kindergartens paving, but they're all working and they're all being involved in there. And The kids that come to me on the autism spectrum and with behavioral issues, sometimes severe, are most often my hardest working kids. They'll stay the most focused on a project. I've watched them, sometimes I don't even know that kid has an issue until they tell me after how amazing it was that he just did all that work, asked me all those questions, 
learned how to use a screwdriver, whatever he just did, he does it. So being outside and sometimes being outside of those classroom settings and outside of that learning structure really helps kids open up with the play, with the projects, and be able to put their energy and focus into something that contributes to whatever we're doing. And for the mindfulness, this is other things I do with kids in my group who are moving constantly. Sometimes what I'll do, let's say, I'm gonna give you an example of kindergartens. I don't know how old your kids are there. But what I'll do is I'll incorporate their movement into the mindfulness activities. So one thing I do with the kindergartens is we'll close our eyes and then we'll become animals. And they imagine themselves as that animal. They have the fur or whatever, the claws. They'll make the sound and then I make them move. They'll move around however that animal moves. They'll do whatever they think that animal does. They'll make the noises. And then that's bringing them into that, that moment too. So whatever, however your kids are behaving, you can use that to bring them into a mindfulness setting. Whether if they're moving constantly, another great one for movement is that mindful walking. So while they're moving, have them making sounds and hearing themselves or stomping on the ground or jumping up and down. Because I'll also get kids who are constantly moving and can't focus, we'll do a yoga class. And the whole yoga class is where we become animals and we move in those motions. So it does work with all those kids. And I do see a huge difference. One class I have has a lot of kids. Most My whole group is 10 kids and nine of them have behavioral issues. As soon as I started incorporating mindfulness and yoga at the beginning of our classes, the rest of our class completely changed. Before we started doing that, everyone was everywhere. Everyone, no one had focus. They would all be fighting with each other. As soon as I incorporated these things into the beginning of our classes, the focus was different. The behavior was different. The ability to work together was different. Everything changed. It's totally doable for kids, any kids, however they're behaving, whatever they're doing, whatever their capabilities are, they can, you can bring this into there. Uh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but Dana, I know you raised your hand. Do you, you want to make a comment? Oh, your mic is off. Unmute, Dana. Thanks. New at this. Um, yeah, just adding on to everything everyone is saying, which is just amazing. Um, yeah, I, I, I myself am a student of a play-based classroom, grades four to six. And just speaking for myself, um, cause I had a lot of anxiety and I, I, um, I couldn't focus. I couldn't. And just having that freedom to not have someone on you telling you what to do at every second, just to be able to relax. That's everything for a child with a behavioral issue or um, an issue. And I, I noticed like as soon as, you know, some teachers in the beginning would tell Sharon and I, this isn't going to work. These five kids here, you know, they do this, they do that. And I just like, you know, let's see, you know, let's just see what's going to happen. And I find that those are the kids, they were so focused, like, yes, I can put my attention on what I want to do. And, and, um, and just talking with them and being like, you know, interested in what, it, what it is they're doing and asking them questions like, Oh, how did you do that? And just, um, building that relationship with them, it just helps them flourish and then, um, complimenting them on what you're seeing. I love your focus. And I find that just, brings them to another level when you compliment what you're seeing, which Sharon mentioned earlier. So just to add that in there, I'll unmute. I want to hear other people. <laughs> I'll mute myself. Thank you. Um, we have about five minutes left. I wanted to see if there's any other um, people that would like to share any stories, uh, ask any questions. Um, otherwise, I've got plenty, but I wanted to open up uh, as well. Um, Karen, I see you put a comment. Did you want to share? Um, so I'm from the Eastern Townships, and it's a relatively large school um, for us. <laughs> we have 300 students, um, and one of the silver linings of post-COVID is our classes are really small. So I have 11 instead of 21, and um, as a result of COVID, we can't use our cafeteria, so we eat together, and we started off in the classroom, but soon I realized that I was pretty comfortable just to take them outside. And then I copied another teacher who was taken into a local wooded area. And so we just would go and sit in the woods where it was cooler too, especially during the heat wave. And they got to sit and eat and just enjoy what was happening around them. 
which I'm not sure I would have done with my group of 21 a few months ago. Not that it's far, like literally it's across the street. I mean, it's not like I have to get an extra person with me or anything. So I think it's allowing me to explore it a little bit more. And we started also taking them out onto the front lawn uh, really short. A uh, years ago, there's a teacher whose goal was to get a hundred trees planted on our school playground. And so the beginning of the co when we returned to school, we went out and just explored like, what do all the trees look like now? And then a few weeks later, we went out and looked at them again and said, okay, what do they look like now? How have they changed? So I think for me, I'm starting to see that taking out 11 isn't so hard. So now when we get back to normal, <laughs> whatever that might look like, I think I'll be more comfortable with taking the 21 or 22 or whatever number of students I have. But it makes me um, curious to see some of the other projects that other schools are doing. We have an outdoor classroom in a, in one sense, it's a basically an outdoor room. It's a room where we can go outside. Um, but I'm curious to see the what Forest Hill has done and some of the other projects. And yeah, I see um, the lady from Forest Hill has hands up. So I'll go look at that and check it out. Very interesting. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, so go ahead. Us. Come and see us. I will do a free visit. No, je pense que après moi, il me reste deux ans avant la retraite. Et euh, j'ai l'âge où je peux, euh, je peux risquer des choses. Je pense qu'il faut arrêter de dire euh, oui, il faut que j'enseigne en salle de classe. Ce ne sont pas toutes les classes qui ont quatre murs. Hein. On peut sortir à l'extérieur. Quand on sort à l'extérieur, ben, les plus petits tenants, on est surpris de ce qu'ils font à l'extérieur. Je pense que les enfants, il faut leur faire confiance. Ils vont prendre des risques. En, faisant, en prenant des risques, ils deviennent responsables, développent la coopération, de la collaboration, c'est incroyable. Et leur créativité est à leur maximum dans la nature. Ce qu'on veut, en fait, en tant qu'enseignante, moi, ce que je veux, c'est en faire des bons citoyens du 21e siècle, être en relation avec l'environnement qui, qui, qui les entoure. Euh, le respect, on a des potagers, euh, il y a toutes les, les, les compétences d'entrepreneuriat aussi. Euh, il y a, il y a le, le, le fait aussi que la communauté euh, qui nous entoure vient nous voir. Alors, il n'y a que des bénéfices à l'enseignement à l'extérieur. Et je pense qu'en tant que, que, que pédagogue, il ne faut pas avoir peur de sortir. Ah, il y a des fois où ça ne fonctionne pas, où il y a des fois, bon, on a complètement perdu le contrôle, mais les enfants par eux-mêmes, euh, nous, c'est eux qui sont responsables du déneigement euh, des, 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 de la plateforme de yoga en hiver. C est, c est, on ne s'en occupe plus, donc ça leur appartient, puis c'est ça qui est merveilleux. Donc, euh, en tout cas, moi, je vous invite pour une visite, ça vous tente. Euh, anytime. Thank you. And maybe I'll just take a moment because we're approaching 5.30 and, and we can stick around later, but I do want to respect the time uh, for people that need to leave. But I want to say um, a couple things. So one is, um, I put my email address and a Facebook page if you're interested in joining. Uh, if you have any questions or if you want to share more resources, please do so I could share them with this group. Uh, I'll also say that, you know, I've been inspired by uh, the work of Shannon, uh, the work of Sharon and Dana, and as well um, from the Climate March, which happened in September, I think. And my plans are for the January or February 2021 is to put on an online conference that is going to explore environmental issues and things around the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And I guess I want to say that please be in touch because um, you know, it's still an idea that will take form in September, but my vision is to have teachers from all around the province sharing what they are doing in their classroom. Uh, youth will be invited for different sessions to share what they've experienced. And I really look forward to just you know, talking about what is happening because many people often are, are unsure of what it might look like. And I want to be able to say, these things are happening in Quebec right now uh, and around the world, and uh, we're going to go from there. So I do encourage you to stay in touch. Um, there's also a school garden page, which is turning into more of an environmental page, uh, so I can put you on that list as well. So just send me an email, and uh, I'll make sure you know about uh, this conference, which will, open, which will happen in the new year. Perfect. Thank you, Ben. I just want to add to that and say, yeah, if anyone ever has questions or, you know, wants some 
techniques of things that you know we've been doing on play-based learning or mindfulness feel free to email any of us i'm sure we're we're going to be there to answer any of your questions even past today so we're always there and we hope that this gets incorporated into more schools and uh yeah it's been uh, it's been fun presenting to all of you so, thank you so much for attending everybody great uh dana you have a, a final comment yeah, just a final comment. So I see that Michelle, hi Michelle, has uh, joined us and she's the teacher who has a play-based classroom in Toronto. Um, I've known Michelle for a long time. She is a phenomenal teacher and I think that um, if, if, you, if you want to, you know, just share what you're doing, um, we'd love, I think we'd love to hear that. It'd be amazing. Yeah, and Michelle is the teacher I went and visited in Toronto last year where she has a kindergarten classroom set up in play-based learning. So it was a great experience and I saw a lot of learning happening. So thank you for joining us, Michelle. Sure, Michelle, you're, you're on mute. You're, you're on mute. You have to unmute. mute okay, okay. okay you're good okay. you give me some loose parts some rocks no problem you put me in front of an iphone or like I, I i'm not very um very good with technology so my apologies no i know i'm late to the party i'm so sorry um i just quickly want to say that um i i was i've been teaching kindergarten now for um seven years when i first started um I didn't have a play-based classroom. And the more play I incorporated into um, my classroom, the more, I, the, the more I saw learning happen, the more motivation, the more the children love to come to school. And then from that, the language just exploded, the math conversation. So I think to anybody, just I just quickly want to say, because you guys probably all have a lot to do and I'm late to the party. If you do want to um, uh, incorporate more play in your classroom and you're just not sure where to start, um, my advice is just, just don't be afraid, try it. Add, set up a little dramatic play area and start with something simple like putting out um, uh, a clipboard with some paper and some writing materials and you'll quickly soon see especially the kindergarten aged um, students they will start making lists that drama center has potential to become a store or a movie theater or in my case Santa's workshop where <laughs> there's so much writing and literacy and imagination and so much problem solving um, so if you do want to start start with something simple add some more open-ended materials to your classroom um, and watch the imagination explodes uh, explode because like the more open-ended the materials are uh, per from personal experience um the more things that like the things go in in amazing direction just really really quickly one quack, uh, quick last example um we had a bunch of rocks um some rocks some popsicle sticks and uh, four six-year-olds decided to turn them into, um, so they were playing with them. We gave them ample time to play with them just for a few days. Um, after they started building their own toys. So from then, this group of boys decided to um, name the toys. They created a poster to, to, to identify what the toys were and decided they wanted to pitch their idea to Toys R Us. So if you think about the complexity of that, all starting from open-ended materials, I don't know that that would have happened had the uh, materials not been as open-ended. So start with open-ended materials, something simple, and watch the magic happen. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Michelle. Yeah, thank you for sharing. Um, so it's, it's 535. Um, unless there is, um, Anyone else that really wants to share their experience or ask a, a question? Anyone have any questions or any final comments? No, then we'll say goodbye. And I guess, as I said to Sharon before and everyone else, you know, this is a conversation that we can have again. Uh, and I look forward to, um, well, I, I want to thank you for joining us. I want to thank you for kind of carrying the torch around play-based learning, around environmental education. And uh, I look forward to this movement continuing over time. So um, we have recorded this webinar. It's going to go up onto the Learn uh, YouTube site at, uh, in the next few weeks. So definitely if you have colleagues that want to be part of this uh, and hear what we heard, it will be there. So again, uh, email me if you have any questions and uh, stay in touch. But thank you very much. And thank you to Shannon, Sharon, and Dana. Thank you. Bye.
Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Okay, how do I hang up? <laughs> it's uh, you can't. You're not allowed. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Yeah, I'm so I'm I that's one thing that I really need to, to, to learn is is are these apps because I struggle. Okay. Oh, there we go. Uh, uh, um, I just want to thank you guys. Thank you so much for this thank wonderful. You, yeah, thank, thank, you. Cool. thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Daniel. Uh, we'll, we'll be in touch. And uh, for the next uh, wonderful webinar. Oh, I forgot to mention it. Uh, I'm doing the Earth School webinar tomorrow as well. I think Shannon. Yeah, yeah. I don't register for that one, Ben. Where do I register? Um, I will send you the link. I think I sent you the link uh, originally like a week or two ago. You were going, you hadn't made it yet, but you were going to send oh, it when you made it. But I don't oh, think I got it. It was like the day before or the day that. Um, you double check, just if you don't mind searching my emails, because I'm. Sure. I'm, I'm almost positive that I sent it because I think I saw it today. Oh, and wow. I can cut and paste the information and okay. there's a link there and that's the registration link. All right. Perfect. If not, I'll resend it. Or I can look it up on the Learn website probably, right? Uh, it's most, unfortunately, mostly we're doing things through, um, through Facebook right now. That was like the main advertising. Just give me one second. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'll forward it to you. Okay. Okay. Sure. Bye. Bye. Right. Bye guys. Bye. -bye.